so the the idea for this is that it's not just like Q and A because why right like but you this is the first time we've ever have not had an audience for an episode so it's kind of fun and it's kind of unknown how we're gonna do this but my thought was the three of us would chat here scoot a little bit and then you move in you're you're kind of off to the side um, and. The premise being, it's your questions that will spark the conversations that we have and the things that we talk about. So it's it's as much like improv as, as anything else. Oh, I see. One of us has been studying. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. My fourth class is tomorrow. Nice. Excellent. See, there's a great example. Uh, so who wants to go first? Who's got a question? I would love to. Mm, go ahead. <laughs> Do so, it. You often see in the martial arts love the male instructors going bald. They're not going bald, but being bald. Craig, what happened? I got better as the hair grew. Ah, see? see? Imagine how good I'd be if I had hair. The first time, actually, I don't know that you've heard this story. Um, I know some of the listeners will have, but the first time Jeremy and I met, the first thing he said to me was, I'm jealous of your hair. Not even like, hello. He like walked in, shook my hand, and goes, I'm jealous. Well, look how much hair he has. I've been shaving my head, not to the skin, but you know, back when I had hair, it was buzzed. To, I think I started at half inch at 12. I had one bottle of shampoo in college. I told you Four years. It. One bottle. Marshall. It was a big bottle. I didn't even use shampoo. I go through a bottle, <laughs> of, no point. Go through a bottle of shampoo in like a day. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you can use my shirt. But, you know, it's, it's, I made the observation when I was very young that somehow the majority of men in martial arts do not have hair. And, and I have no idea why, but it seems to be a higher percentage than just in the general population? Well, I think there's a couple reasons for that. The first is, of course, we all, all want to look like Bruce Lee. So we grow the hair out like Bruce Lee, and it doesn't look good at all. Then it gets to the point where we just get tired of going to get our hair cut and buzz it all off. Mm -hmm. And the third is we have students like Noah. I mean, <laughs> what is that? what's that going to do there? That's true. Those are my reasons. I, I have the opposite. I didn't want to. I, I don't like getting my hair cut, so I just don't go. Oh, there you go. See? Man, man. Man, man. <laughs> There's. I once had someone try to just explain it to me that, oh, well, you know, hair and hair can be grabbed and all this. I was like, yeah, but what about all the women in class? They're like, well, hmm. uh, yeah. So I don't have a good answer to your question that you didn't quite ask in the way that I'm answering it. <laughs> uh, it's just a thing. Martial artists tend to have less hair. The ones that do have hair, I'll add on. You know, most of them have a tight back, either real short hair or they have a back in either a man bun or a ponytail. Mm -hmm. Do you ever put your bun on top? Sometimes, but yeah. it takes a little extra effort. I don't effort. think I've seen that. It takes extra effort. So it depends. It depends on my mood. Katan's agreeing about getting the bun on top. It takes a it, yeah. It takes. It's, it's a workout. I have to do it every night when I go to bed. Yeah, I'm yeah. Exhausted by the end of it. Yeah, I'm sweating. I'm huffing and puffing. It's a mess. See, and I work out all day, so I don't <laughs> want to take the time. <laughs> Next. So back to that. What about all the women in the class? I think you just finished a book about women in martial arts? We just released a, a book, Women in the Martial Arts, uh, rooted in episodes that we've done. I, I had some say in which episodes we were referencing in that. Some of the women that I think had the strongest stories are people that I personally think are very inspirational, like my original instructor. Uh, it, was, it was a duo. She's, it was her and her husband. She's in that, in that list. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like there's a part B. No, okay. I, want, I, want, I, I haven't read it, so I'm okay. just wondering if you would talk a um, about it. So a lot of the books that we do refer back to podcast episodes that we've done. Like the Martial Artist Handbook started as a collection of, of episodes. You know, we went, it's like, okay, what episodes do we want to do? And then we broke those down into an outline. And then I narrated it, and then we transcribed that. Like that's how we mm -hmm. did that process. This one is a little bit different in that the interviews pretty much stand as they are. And then Jenny, who heads up our book division, approached a number of women that she knows in the martial arts, women that she finds inspirational or, or connections that she's made that she appreciates and got them to kind of write introductions because let's, let's face it, 
women in most martial arts schools do not reflect the general population of women in the area, right? Women are roughly 50% of the population. Um, there are some exceptions, but pretty uncommon. And women are rarely 50% in a martial arts school. With a caveat that I've seen, if a woman owns a school, it's much closer to 50-50. And we can kind of extend that out. And I'm curious what, what you guys think, what you've noticed. When women are in a position of leadership, there is much more participation by women. Yes, I agree. We have Tashi Deborah here, and she encourages the women and the children <coughs> to uh, participate more. I'll go back to that in a minute. But I think women in the martial arts is key. Now, if you look at this table here, Craig's actually the tallest out of the bunch. And that's a good thing. Because I remember, I'm sure Jeremy remembers back when we were beginning, we'd walk into the martial arts school and the instructor would be like this. Be tall and we, a lot of them were like really big guys. Everyone has told me and always has been. <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm coming up, I'm like, why does he need martial arts? Mm -hmm. It's women and small guys like me, I'm only five foot eight. Those are the people that need martial arts most. So what we teach, I know what all of us teach, especially you saw with Jeremy's seminar today, it works for everyone. That's the trick. If it works for everyone, it's really good. Now I'm going to go back to women because they are God's gift to a martial arts academy. I'll say that. Why do I say that? Point in case, Ms. Katan, Shurshan Katan was here yesterday. We had a four-year-old girl come in with her mom, and the girl just looked at me and went, I stepped back, I put Ms. Katan in front of me, and she ran the, the introduction, we ran great. Afterwards, the young lady didn't, didn't want to leave. She was having so much fun. So there you go. The energy that men and women bring to anything that we do mm -hmm. is different. different. And not that a man doesn't necessarily have female energy or could not even be overwhelmingly feminine energy, but typically, right? And so that, that variance, that balance, um, I have more feminine energy than, than most men, but you know, the, the exact, you know, percentage isn't going to be the same as, as yours or as yours or, and I, and I, there's something really good in that. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with all the points made. I don't know that I have much more to contribute because you guys split, expressed my thoughts pretty much. Um, <clears throat> I have noticed as I've been kind of traveling around schools a bit more, I've seen you know, I've been I've been in the martial arts for 20 years. When I was in class, when I first started, there was maybe one or two girls in the class mm -hmm. with me. And now I go to seminars. To even the one we had today, there were there was it was 50 percent women. I counted. Oh, wow. uh, I counted specifically just to know. And you know, Jeremy, you and I went to a seminar a few months ago, mm -hmm. and I get it, it was actually there were more women than men there. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where it's really cool to see that kind of break away that that idea that martial arts is only for men or only a masculine thing right. it kind of because martial arts once you walk through the door and you bow on the mat you're a martial artist you're not you know right. at, at least at my school we don't have a distinction you're a martial artist and that's that's how you're treated i've, I've done research is, is a little bit too um formal of a term Perused. but i've i've explored that question you know why does it tend to be Overall, I mean, it's no secret if you go to any martial arts event, if you go to a big tournament, you know, the, the, the male divisions are larger than the female divisions. The overall participation is more men. While we don't make a concerted effort with martial arts radio to bring on a certain percentage or alternate, like, here's a fun thing that many of you may not know. In terrestrial radio, it's generally accepted you go male, female, male, male, female with songs. Like you're trying to, it's usually close to 50-50. We don't do anything like that. So what does that mean? Most of our episodes are with men because we have far more men that are applying to be on the show than, than women. But why is that? At the heart of it, what we do tracks back to something that is, if we explore the, the biology of it, is inherently masculine. It's combat. If you look across species, the male tends to be the defender of the nest or the pack or the, the whatever, right? And it is something that happens in our physiology too. It doesn't mean it, it should be that way, 
but I think as we understand why it is, it can allow us to create a more welcoming environment and not just be fight, 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 which only appeals to, even in, in modern times, like it's a, even a narrow subset of men that want that. I agree. I concur. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like we're at the I, logical I like end we, of that thought. Yeah, I feel like we, okay. <laughs> I feel like we, and I, the word I would have used was you've perused. You may not have researched, perused, but you yeah, I definitely perused. didn't research. But I peruse. Peruse. Yeah. Gandered. Gandered. Examined. Evaluated. Okay. We can stop with this. <laughs> I thought we we're doing word association. Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> what else? I have a question. Uh -oh. So you all have had schools or are you afraid, Tashima? Oh, I'm always you, you speak, I'm scared. <laughs> so you've all had schools in the past or have them now. And I believe most schools well, all schools have a curriculum. They have a plan of how they're going to teach. You know, when a white belt comes in, and mm -hmm. you know, we're going to teach the white belt this, and then we'll move up in ranks. Most are belt ranks. Not all schools are belt <laughs> ranks, but most are. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on, you have all these different people coming in with different abilities, ages, you know, shapes, sizes, all that. You have a curriculum. In order to get your yellow belt, you say you need to be able to do thus and such. What happens when you have people who come in, they're very motivated, with a good heart, they want to do this, but something is awry. They might have a physical disability, mm -hmm. they might have you know, a mental challenge, uh, an emotional challenge. Do you promote them? How do you, how do you deal with that? I'm not going to speak first on this because this is the thing that I yell the loudest. I'm going to, I'll start. Because I'm approaching the age of 65. I've been doing this for 50 years. I thought you, you were saying it's like, in the next 20 years, you'll be 65. I'm approaching 65, too. I know. We're all approaching. We're all Some, a little, Some are a little further taking, away than others. <laughs> but as I go through my martial arts career, I notice my physical aptitude changing. Even my emotional aptitude changing, thanks to some of my students change my mind on many things. So I see things different. Some of the, some of the things I, I would have taught three years ago, I won't teach to adults now. I'll teach to the teenagers and I, anybody at, up to the age of 35. So you're always talking about exploration. You're talking about that in a recent podcast. That's what martial arts has to be. Because for me to continue, we had four new students. One was in their 50s, the other were in their 60s. So if I teach them things that I teach my teens, they'll be out the door real quick. But from working with like Jeremy and Craig and Andrew and others, we have curric curriculum that can fit in the proper place at the proper time. So there's my aspect on it. You have to be flexible. Realize I, I am one of the I'm almost at the end of the baby boomers, and there's a lot of us out there. And they're starting to come in the door. So that's something we have to look for. Always adapt, always change. Be like a ninja. You you, go. You've got a, a bunch of students that are maybe, I mean, you've got some, not, some yeah. neurotypical. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, and... yeah. Um, so, first, as far as the curriculum thing goes, my advice is always just teach. If you're running your own school, you're running your own program, you have to teach what you're comfortable doing and you have to know your limitations. And so part of that is if you have trouble identifying with people who have a mental or an emotional or physical hardship and you don't think you will best serve them, then point them in a direction that will best serve them. Don't, don't try to act like you will and you won't. So what that does is that allows me to have a little flexibility in my curriculum to go, okay, um, this person, I have a student and they've worked on in warehouses and all sorts of things. And they're, they're in their mid to late fifties. Now their body, the lower half of their body is so shot from standing all day on a cement floor and not with the best shoes sometimes and things like that. Kicking to the ribs is just not something that's going to happen unless the person's on the ground. <laughs> right. And so we just modify it. It doesn't mean that the technique is going to be any less effective. Honestly, kicking a knee is probably more effective at times than kicking a ribs, right? Depending on what your, 
what your focus is. If your focus is on tournaments, you can't teach knee kicking mm. because you're not allowed to do that, right? If, if the focus of my school is I'm going to help you become the best version of yourself that you want to be. So, however, and that the most important part of that is that you want to be because as a teacher, it's my job to always see you 10 steps ahead of where you are. That means when you reach what you think is your best, I can see 10 steps past that. But whatever steps you take to reach the best you can do, that's, that's you. Martial arts is a personal journey. And as an instructor, as a school owner manager, it's our jobs to help facilitate that growth. Last time I did the, did the math based on my own experience in teaching, it was something like nine out of 10 students that I've taught in 18 years have um, never had to use their physical skills in a fight. So if I'm only ever teaching them and preparing them for something that nine out of 10 will never encounter, thankfully, right? Like that's a good statistic, right? Nine out of 10 never encounter and I'm not doing anything else and factoring in an emotional need. Sometimes people need confidence. And if all I'm doing is telling them what, setting them up with material that they are not able to accomplish for any limitation or depending on what the, the hindrance is, right? Then I'm setting them up for failure and not success. That's not to say that if a jumping kick is in my expectations for a black belt and that's the expectation, I still want them to jump. I just don't, I just care, don't if care if they jump, jump up and hit the head on the ceiling. ceiling. I, just I just want, want to see their feet, feet leave the ground. ground. And, and I, I that I don't allow an excuse, right? A hardship isn't an excuse. I had, um, I've worked with students in wheelchairs uh, and I've gotten them to stomp through boards and break boards. They can't walk, but they can break the board because it wasn't an excuse. It was, okay, we're going to find a way to make this work for you. We're going to work around what you need, not what I, don't do it like me, do it like you. I guess it's the long, that was a lot of words. That's okay. That's okay. I'm out of words now. All right. It's your turn. When I, when I take a question like that, I approach it with logic, right? And, and there are a few things that I've come to be, believe very strongly in that, in a sense, take me into a corner on how much leeway I have with something like that. The first is, it is very rare, and I think very few people agree that as one's age progresses and physical abilities diminish, that you should be demoted. So, so if that is true, then rank is not about physical skill. Some people will say, but you, you achieved it, so maybe, maybe you don't progress, you hold. Okay, okay fine. fine. I, I, you know, you know when I carve out space for pretty much any ideology, ideology on this. But to me, rank has never been about skill. It's about, about growth on your own journey. And I'm very fortunate in the school that I grew up in was a bit progressive for the time. It was never, okay, you need to know how to do this. Everything, Everything was up for grabs. grabs. There were people, the one thing that was, I, I think, strongly enforced was you had to know your forms, right? This was primarily a, a karate school. And so you had to know your next kata or your next two katas for progress. But it was loose enough that I, I knew like three or four katas ahead of where I needed to be. There were other people who could barely remember how to do a form and they would get out there and the instructor knew that they tried, that they had been practicing and that their brain just didn't work that way. Maybe there was something atypical about the way they processed that information. I don't know. But if you showed that you had made the effort, maybe they would prompt you a little bit. And maybe that same person, I'm thinking one in particular, was an absolute monster sparring. There was that element of martial arts that they loved. I, I love doing forms. forms. Always have. So, so more was expected of me doing my forms. And you can look at that and say, well, is that fair? No, it's not. Should it be? Because we're all on our own journey. One of the things I've said often about martial arts is it gives back exactly and only what you put in. And if I'm putting in my effort to become a better version of me and I become a better version of me and you put in effort to become a better version of you and you put in effort to become a better version of you, why should we expect that the, if we're starting from different places, why does that effort mean we're going to end up at the same place? 
And I think that holding people to rigid standards, I think there are two important things to say there. One, I think it's silly because I think it, it reduces the likelihood that someone is going to remain and gain the benefits of training, number one. And number two, I think a lot of times people will go to that because over the course of, of my life, we've become far more standardized in public education. We see that that as, and, and you know, I'm, I feel quite confident in this, the caliber of teachers has degraded because they are given less opportunity to develop. And there's more teaching to tests, more scoring, more metrics. And so our expectation is that we should pull that same concept into martial arts, where if you've been teaching for a long time, as, as the three of us have, if, if you have, you know that you don't work with each student the same way because they're doing things differently and that you can recognize, you know what, that person is at a blue belt level and that person is also at a blue belt level because I know what they've done. I know what they've overcome. I know where they're at. I know that this person is great at forms. This person's great at sparring or this person is an absolute wizard when it comes to putting a weapon in front of them, that there are so many different avenues that they can find and explore on their own path that when we factor all that together, they don't look anything close to the same, but they're both on that blue belt level for them. And some of you may not understand quite what I'm talking about and folks that are listening or watching might not understand, but I'm sure you do. And I think that that is not only a liability, is not only not a liability, I think it's an asset. I think it's one of the, my favorite elements about martial arts because there are so many different pieces to it. In fact, there's so much that you cannot reach a very high level of expertise in all of it simultaneously. You, you're never gonna show me someone who is a world-class fighter, world-class at forms, world-class with weapons, top-notch self-defense practitioner, in good shape, understands the philosophy and the history and, and the they break boards, board, right? Like just all of it at a super, super high level. There's, there's a time. time. I've, I've forgotten, forgotten more forms than I know. I, I could, I, I could learn, learn, any learn any of them. There are plenty of technical things that I've regressed on, on that I could find, find again. again. You, know, you know, there might be a couple things with some jump spinning kicks. kicks. Maybe I wouldn't be able to get back to where I was in my 20s. I don't oh, know. Yeah. I, I, I think I still have the physical ability to get back there on all that, but that's not going to last forever. So it's kind of a, a, a long-winded three-part answer, but does that, what do you? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's kind of what I expected to hear knowing you guys, like, you know, um, but I want to put it out there. And so when you think about um, particularly, let's say, you know, almost any, I think anyone <laughs> will, can get this up, if they go to a good school, they're supported, they're steered you know, in the right direction, they can get, a, it might take a longer time, obviously, for someone, and if you're, if you're honest with them and say, you know, you need to work on this or do that or whatever, but they can get that black belt. Now, after black belt, I, I feel that the journey becomes very individualized, and you can select, you know, well, I'm really into weapons training, so I really want to focus on that, or I want to do this or that. Um, but then where, you know, when you see, um, Grandmaster this, Grandmaster that, Professor this, this and that. You know, it kind of um, makes me wonder, is that person 10 times better than that black belt? And how do you um, kind of guide, you know, mentor those people or, or who does mentor those people? Or I mean, I don't know. It's just kind of a, an open uh, question mark in my mind that, um, you know, how, how do you get to that point? And I know I've tested several black belt tests and I've done what I was expected to do, but am I really, is it really necessary? I mean, once you reach a certain level or once you, you know, it's in your heart that you are a martial artist, it really doesn't matter, does it? I, I don't think it matters. Yeah. I don't think it matters. And when we, you know, is there, is there, is there an argument that sparks more, passion and disagreement than rank. And I don't think there is. I don't know if you guys would agree, but just what is a black belt, right? I mean, I routinely get into arguments on the internet with people about that. It's the one thing that I will step up and argue with people about. 
because I don't want people to say you are not a black belt. You have no right to say that that person is not a black belt. Maybe they wouldn't have a black belt in your school, but there's also somebody else's school. You wouldn't have a black belt, right? Like it's totally fine. And our traditions in, in the martial arts, especially Western implementations of martial arts, like in America, are rooted in military tradition. You know, we brought all these concepts back and it doesn't take much, uh, what's the word you use? Not exploration. Perusing. Perusing. It doesn't take much perusing to learn that it's handled dramatically differently in Asian countries. You know, sometimes so differently that you wouldn't quite recognize it. Well, so you can look at those military traditions and it doesn't take much conversation with someone in the military, active or prior service, and they'll tell you uh, it's problematic there too. That just because you're promoted, you serve, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you were around plenty of people that were promoted over and they didn't deserve it. And it, it, this person was bent out of shape and it happens constantly. Yeah. It's, it's just as political in the military as it is in the martial arts. How much time we got? No, yeah. Get that one. And so that, that's why I, I think it's a, a, the best analogy I've heard, and I wish I remembered where I first heard this, but is in comparing rank more to academic titles. You know, mm -hmm. baccalaureate, mm -hmm. master's, yep. Yep. PhD, postdoc, et cetera. Because if you talk to someone who is, you know, has their doctorate in biology, you don't assume that they know everything about biology. And that if they're talking to another person about biology, that if one of them got their doctorate before the other person, that they are inherently better, wiser, and know everything more about everything. Right? Like we, we do that. It's why I'm... I'm resistant to titles. I don't put stripes on my belt um, because I'm still learning. Oh, I'll go both into this. <clears throat> In my humble opinion, a grandmaster is somebody that has their own style, a definite style of martial arts. Like a uh, Nay, he has his own style. He has Dikiti Churches Rodas Kali. That's his family style. He's the head of the system. Oof, there's your grandmaster there. Now, as far as age and rank, may come up here. Come up here. Yeah. You can just stand right up here. Because I know right now, right right over there, right over there. Right over there. Yeah, you gotta be in the camera there. Come towards Now the there's a, a a debate on what age is a black belt. May, how old are you? Nine. She'll get her black belt in September. Assuming she keeps coming and works hard? Yeah. Okay. Well, she, she keeps, she, no undoubtedly, she, she keeps coming and works hard. If you had crossed hands with her in Jeremy Seminar today, I, I was amazed. I was shocked. I didn't believe. I, one of the best ones out there, hands down. So this, good job, man. So this Your face is, red yet? Yeah, a little no, bit. A little, she, little, she, little bit of flush in yeah. it. So this is what a black belt is about. Uh, oh, is it about? Thank you, babe. Now, if you look back to if you look back to Japan and you see some of the black belts are six and seven, they look like they deserve it. So we get over here and we say, if you're not a certain age, you're a black belt. But that's crazy. It's just crazy. I mean, if you my belief, my belief for the longest time was 11 years old was minimum age. And then May shows up. May and my, I'm like, all right, well, you're going to have to change that. I mean, they got mine at night, Tashi, so. Yeah, but that was a whole other story. Maybe that's so. why he thought it was 11. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> but there you go. I mean, if these, if these kids put out their best and they show up time and time again and work hard, you want to deny them something? That's not, that's not what martial arts is about. I want to pass it to you. I want to say one thing first, because I know I'll forget if I don't. If you see someone training for, for say they don't have a belt, yep. can you tell what rank they are, give or take? Hopefully, yes. How about you? Yeah. I, I Rank, not necessarily. I can tell how long they've trained. I mean, that's... That's if, more if, so. If we, if we roughly correlate. Yeah. Yep. 
experience, tra time training, rank, right? If we roughly equate those. You can watch someone and you can say, even across style, yeah. that person has the heart of, mm -hmm. they move like A, right? And that's how I was raised. It's, it's that spirit that you can see. And sometimes kids have it at nine. Sometimes adults never get it. Um, I, I think I've only said this to you, maybe both of you, but I've never said it on an episode. Um, in my somewhat humble opinion, um, I believe that the greatest detriment to martial arts is rank and title. I don't wear a belt, hardly ever. Um, I don't use a title. I just show up and we have fun. I don't care what order my students learn things in. I don't care what piece of cloth is around their waist. I don't care if they've been there for three. I had a student who had trained for less than three months and went to free training day Northeast. Great. Right. And I said, this is going to be a lot. You're new to this, but go. And if you want to go and have fun, go and have fun. Um, the single as a as a, somebody who jumped right into doing this professionally, like right. Like I was 17 years old when I took over a program. Right. Out of high school, six weeks. Um, the single hardest part about doing this professionally for me in those years up until a few years ago was that I was always too young to know it, too young to know anything of value mm -hmm. in conversations. Now, I also surrounded myself with people who did care about what I had to say and what I did well and were humble enough to, to exchange ideas with me and not just talk at me. Um, but I, I go out of my way. My, the, least, the thing that I like least about running a school is having to do the rank thing. Like that's my least favorite part. Watching somebody have an aha moment on the mat where they feel empowered is more powerful to me than putting a piece of cloth around their waist. Um, but on the flip note, people need goals and watching students accomplish those goals and getting that physical thing as my recognition that they've accomplished it is the best part um, for me. But, you know, and we did talk about this, so we don't have to talk for long, but last time I was promoted in Kempo, I talked to both of you because I, I was not comfortable with it. It bumped me above my original instructor. My original mm -hmm. instructor has not um, promoted in 20 something years because he, he instilled in me that the, the stripes don't matter. Just keep learning. And the stripes don't matter. I have I have more stripes than him now, and I still wouldn't want to spar him. <laughs> <laughs> and he still has things he can teach you. Right. And you've pretty much always had things you could teach him. Right. Right. Because to, to tie it back to what we talked about before, he and I run the schools together because he is excellent at sparring and the grappling, the kind of the combat sport side. He doesn't like doing forms and weapons. I love doing forms and weapons. So my, my training, my experience, the way I move, the way I do things is much different than his, mm -hmm. but we were humble enough together to compliment mm -hmm. each other and both kind of suck it up. I, you know, I'd be like, he'd say, all right, we're sparring this with after media. And I was like, oh, come on, can't we just do forms? <laughs> and then the next month I'd be like, all right, my turn, we're doing forms. And then he'd be like, oh. <laughs> right. But we, we respected each other enough to give our best effort. But, um, yeah, the, as far as if, if the goal is to become the best version of yourself that you want to be, then the belts, the stripes, the titles, they don't matter. They don't. They, it's nice. I, I've never, ever had a problem referring to you by your title, Tashi. I've never had a problem referring to you as Sensei Jeremy. But to me, that title is not so much you demanded of me to give you. It's I am showing it out of respect and reverence for the things that you've taught me, you've shared with me. When it's somebody who walks up and demands you call them by the title, that's mm -hmm. where it starts to really seem like it gets closed off. That that bridge of learning goes away because it feels less accessible. They've put a barrier. Yeah, and yeah. and when, when you when you call Tashi Mark Tashi Mark, you're not that one needs to be built between you, but it's like building a bridge, right? You're, yeah. you're, mm -hmm. you're creating a conduit between the two of you. You are asking for his knowledge. Yeah. Whereas if he came up to you and said, 
call me Tashi Mark. Now, now it's a barrier you have to overcome to even get to what he's offering. Well, and, and the thing is, I mean, we didn't even talk about this yet. So it's worth mentioning Tashi Mark's been my, one of my instructors, actually, I'd, I'd honestly say my primary instructor for five, six years now, maybe more. I don't remember. It's been a while. It's been a couple of days. Yeah. A lot of sticks to the head. Um, but when we're not in here, I call him Mark. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like yeah. when we're not training together, I call him Mark. Yep. Yeah. Calls me Craig. Like there's no, that goes away completely. It's that it just drops. So yeah. when we fall into an environment where we're doing martial arts, we, we fall into the titles. Right. You know, because, because it's a role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not R O L E role. Right. It's, it's, you're assuming the role yep. of yep. instructor. Yep. You're assuming the role of student. Yep. And it just because it, it has to work, right? You're it does. you're a pretty it terrible does. instructor if you don't have any students. Yeah, well, that doesn't they work that me. well. <laughs> that's what they tell me. <laughs> we we need both parts of the equation have to be there, or it doesn't work. Right. Yeah, and then right. martial arts is not passed on, and that's sad. Yep. Feels like a good ending point. What else? What's next? So, so hopefully, just yeah. like, just to, please to add on to that. So hopefully, the days are gone, or pretty much gone which, I mean, we faced this before going to tournaments and things like that, where you have somebody walk up to you and say, hey, hey, I outrank you. They're not going. And with a finger pointing, I outrank you. Count these stripes on my belt. I've had that sure. in tournaments. Th those we days are not, not gone. gone. Well, um, we can hope. But they are, they are, I believe they are going. They're waning. Uh, for, for two reasons. One, I think there are more and more people like Craig, and I'm, I'm pretty close to your philosophy on this about rank and title. Um, people wanting it to go away, recognizing that it doesn't necessarily correlate with a system that is conducive to learning on the one hand. Then on the other hand, you have people who have created a culture in their school and their system that is so, that so prioritizes chasing rank that you will end up with people who are 30, 35 years old that are eighth, ninth, 10th degrees. And then where do they go? Are you, are you saying that that person at that age has learned everything they can and that they're not going to get better for the next 30 years of their training, right? Regardless of how you feel about someone at that age being that rank to say that they're, they've maxed out at that point, it, it, it starts to beg a question. And I think the more that question is asked, the more people go, is this the best way to do this? And I think more and more people are saying there's some value here, but maybe it's time to make a change. It's interesting you say it that way about the 30 year old, the 30 year old ninth, 10th degrees who they're supposed to know everything. Well, that's silly. I have regressed through the martial arts. I've been doing it for 50 years. I, I know nothing. I know nothing as compared to some of my instructors. Like, I'm going to say this because some of these other grandmasters. I have progressed past them. Mm -hmm. Like I said, again, I still don't know anything, but yet they were in t they're wearing 10 stripes and I'm like, okay, all right. Oh, okay. So rank has not much meaning. Recently, when we were up uh, with Andrew on a Saturday, one of, one of the, one of the black belts asked what my title was. Well, somebody said I was a guru. He was, oh, you're a guru. I'm like, whoa, slow down. Said, I asked, what does sensei mean? Sensei means teacher, or one who's going to be forced. That's what guru means. These are just titles. There's no magic behind them. Call me guru, call me Tashi, call me sensei. Just don't call me late for dinner. That's all I ask. <laughs> but these titles that people take upon themselves are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I was given the title of Tashi. I found out the title of Tashi meant helper. That's, that's, I got that when I was fourth degree, promoted my fourth. That's the highest title you will ever get at my school. You become a helper, and that's what you do. You help. That's what martial arts is about. Got to help. I've come to like the title coach. Coach. Yeah, I mean, so for me, titles. Um, <laughs> I I think I I have like five or six of them because I do so many different systems and styles. So I have them in a bunch, um, and I use none of them. <laughs> um, most most students call me Mr. W or whatever. Like, I, again, as long as people are talking to me with respect, I don't really care, right? Like, if you just be respectful of me, I'll be respectful of you. You be cool, I'll be cool. 
right? That's kind of my rule. Um, but as far as like, you know, figuring out, you know, I outrank you this, that, and the other, I usually just say, okay, uh, all right. Um, but when you, the idea that if you become higher and higher and higher in belts in one system, that you then know every answer to every system, it's not accurate, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, my, my base system is Kempo. You know, in Kempo, they may not do any groundwork at the school that somebody gets a black belt or higher in. And that's a white belt skill in jujitsu. So you're a black belt in one thing, you're a white belt in another, in another thing, you gotta humble up. When I came here to start learning Kung Fu and the things that we've been working on, I, I was already a black belt with a bunch of stripes on my belt. I never once wore it here. I asked for a white belt and I said, I'd make me work through it again. Because if nothing else, maybe I'm not a white belt because I know how to make a fist and I know how to hit. So that may happen quicker, but I don't want, I'm not going to put the belt on and assume that I know everything that I'm about to be taught. And, and that's important. And putting on that white belt and getting the chance to just learn and not have to know it is, is an excellent feeling. Look, good ending point. I think or so. Are you gonna, okay. Because you, you had had your hand. I'm up. feeling passionate. So. I can tell. I, I did have a question um, more on longevity. I think um, training kind of goes in waves. Sometimes you're really intense. Yes. Sometimes that's tied to belts or other times. And then I think you kind of need to recover from that. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about how you restore yourselves, how you take that time to step back mm -hmm. and think, what's next? I preach connecting to your why. What is the reason you're training? Because I think if you have a very clear understanding of why you're doing what you're doing, it stems from that. If your reason, and, and I don't judge anybody's reason, right? If, so if your reason is I want to be the most prepared I can possibly be for a street confrontation, you probably do have times that are more intense as you get closer to simulating what that might look like. And that probably bangs you up a bit. You probably need to physically recover. You might have times where if your why is more around competition, that you become emotionally drained. And so you need to take a step back and recover emotionally. I think, and I've said this for a long time, one of the worst things we've ever done in martial arts is condition our students that taking breaks is such a terrible thing to say, don't go take a month off. Don't go do that. Why would you do that? Oh, you're not going to come back. And most of the time when the instructors say that, it's coming from a place of fear. They're afraid of losing that student. And quite often, sadly, they're afraid of losing that student because they're afraid of losing that tuition. Now, it's no secret. And you both deal with this. I don't have a school at this point. But you both have students that you lose, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently, to other sports and other pursuits. But if they get something beneficial out of their time with you, have you lost them? Or did you simply give them different preparation than someone who sticks around for a long time? Right. So I see nothing wrong with OK, this week I'm going to go five times. And next three weeks, I'm going to go once. In August, I'm going to go you know, hang out on the Cape for a month. And I'm not, you know, maybe I train a little bit on my own. Uh, and maybe this year, I'm focused on physical training. Maybe this year, I'm focused on you know, the academic side. You know, for the last few years, I have not had what I would call a full-time instructor that I've been training under. But you better believe I've become a better martial artist. I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about this stuff and the way that I approach it is different than it was you know, 20 years ago. And I think that's not only okay, I think it's a good thing. I want to see what, what you think. You want me or him I, first? He better go he, first. Well, he, he just talked. All right, all right, all right. Your turn. My OCD kicks in on this one. I get very, very nervous. But recently, myself, I've been making sure that I take time once a month to get away and go somewhere, whether, whether it's up to Keene, up to Exeter. I go for a weekend now. It's good 
to get away once in a while. Now, if a student can come and train hot with their heart for six months, we've given them some. And if they decide to do something, if they decide to do something that progresses them in a direction that they should be going, my heart's all in it. I mean, one of the one of the happiest heartbreaks mm -hmm. is when I see my youth go off to college, my teens going to college. I mean, it breaks my heart. They're leaving me, but then they're going off to do great things, and I've seen many great things come out of the school. And I'm going to see many more great things come out of the school. But that's living, that's growing, that's blossoming, that's becoming who you are. Everybody has to become who they want to be, what they want to do. If you're feeling burnt out or tired or you've trained a lot, and one of the best things you can do is, Jeremy said, find your why. For me, it's redefine your scope, right? Like I've just spent a month staring at this jab, trying to figure out how to make it work. My arm hurts. One arm is way more jacked than the other. I've only been punching with my left, my right, weak, whatever it is, right? Redefine your scope. Say, okay, what did I get out of that? What do I want to do next? And one of the things that one of my other really good friends in the arts and, and somebody who's, who's taught me a lot told me he he has he said he's on a decade cycle he's trained for most of his life every 10 years something shifts right now 10 years is a long time he's looking backwards and he's trained his whole life right but every couple of years something might shift you might say i've really been doing forms for the past year like i i've learned 12 forms form a month i need a break i'm gonna go hit the bag for a while and then you spend time doing that or like Jeremy said, because that resonated, right? Uh, I need a break, I need a month. Take a month. I mean, there were times in my training with you where there still are because life happens and I get busy and I'm gone for three or four weeks. And then I come right back and we just pick up where we left off. I'm, not, I'm nowhere near not training with you, right? Because the other benefit I have, because I have a school is I'm teaching. So I'm still getting my practice in. But even at that, there were times when I'd be gone for a while because of work or whatever and I'd come back down and he'd say oh show me this form and I'd be like hmm mm. you first I've heard, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard these stories I've heard these stories or he'd watch me do it and I'd do it wrong and he'd say what is that that's not what I showed you I'd say oh that was, it was the remix the remix yeah it was the remix I got excited I'm sorry um, so the thing that, that's really important is breaks are okay like it's fine to do and that's again my mantra I'm going to help you find the best version of yourself that you want to have. And at that time, you may value time off more than that version. That's perfectly fine. That doesn't mean you're gonna go away forever. It just means you need a break. Um, going away, changing your scenery, having a guest teacher, all those things help you stay engaged in the arts in different ways. Um, but I also agree with what Tashi said, uh, that you have when the greatest heartbreak is when a student leaves, right? And I'm going to add in, you know, to college or off mm -hmm. to the career, going into the military, whatever it may be. But I'm going to add in one of the proudest moments I ever have is when a student who leaves me after a year or two when they're nine gets an athletic scholarship somewhere to go to college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I almost always will drop a note somehow. Mm -hmm. I'll email their parents who I haven't talked to in years, or I'll write, I'll hand write a note and send it because I'm so proud of them. Yeah. They, still, they still got something. And it's my job as a teacher to plant seeds and I don't get to see what, they, what the tree grows to become sometimes, but at least I was a part of the process. If martial arts is always your top priority, that makes me sad because it means other really cool big things are not coming into your life. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Thank you, good discussion. Um, in, in addition, recently, uh, this is something that I've I've, um, I've found come up more in conversation when I, you know, speak about martial arts with people outside of, you know, the school that I train at. And just, uh, but in addition to there being so many pro martial arts communities and uh, people who enjoy it as much, there's also um, I've seen a lot of that demonization of martial arts on the basis of promoting violence. And I'm just curious to know what uh, your thoughts might be on that. And, Go, go, go for it. <laughs> well, My hand was up. That first. was 
<laughs> um, so I spent a lot of time teaching in public school, and I'm the karate guy, right? Like that's literally what the kids call me, the karate guy. Okay. Sometimes with a remix. That's right. Mm -hmm. Some of you know that story. We're not going to repeat it. Yeah, I'm not allowed to repeat it, but um, there'll be a different avenue for me yeah. to repeat that story mm -hmm. at some point. Anyway, um, that is the biggest hurdle. You know, administrators or parents say, I don't want my kids to learn violence. Okay, come in and watch me do what I do and tell me I'm violent. It also helps that I'm probably the least assuming violent person on the planet, right? <laughs> Natasha Debbie, your granddaughter, calls me the Kung Fu Panda. And she laughs when she thinks yeah. of me because she just thinks I'm funny, right? Um, when somebody approaches me specifically and says, why are you teaching violence? I ask them what movie they watch to make them feel that way. That's what I ask. What did you watch on TV that made you feel that I'm promoting violence? And then when they ask me, and then when, when they tell me, I go, oh yeah, well, okay. Of course, you watched whatever you watch. John Wick is not a documentary. <laughs> I, I was going to say The Raid, but I, I can't. <laughs> they should watch Best of the Best, then they know. Yeah, exactly. It's they so wouldn't cool. be concerned at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so violence is when you, you set out to hurt someone. Martial arts doesn't teach violence because we don't teach you how to hurt someone, right? right? There, you know, there's, I don't remember the title of the book you might, by Funakoshi. It's like the 20 guiding principles of karate or something, something like that. Does that sound like? guiding principles, yeah. Yeah, the first one's karate begins and ends with right. It begins and ends with about respect. It's about discipline and hard work. And again, finding the best version of yourself. Martial arts is one of the oldest forms of character development and self-improvement in the world. It just doesn't get promoted that way through media like TV and movies because no one really wants to watch a movie of someone coming in and being getting spoken to nicely. That's not compelling enough. Those are the TikToks I scroll by. <laughs> then I find the ones yelling, those ones. Martial arts nowadays in any civilized country is about self-defense character development, taking care of yourself and your loved ones. If you're in an art where you can hurt yourself just by training, that's not really martial arts. That's not really self-defense. That's not self-protection. You're hurting yourself. If you're in a martial art you, where your main thing is, thing is to go beat people up, that is not a traditional martial art, not in my eyes. They call it other things. Mm -hmm. It's not a traditional martial art. Traditional martial art is when you're a warrior planting a garden. You're always ready, and you never want to use it. At the same time, a traditional martial arts teaches you to walk down the street, and for some reason, none of the bad guys bother you. They just can sense it. You don't walk down the street trying to be one of the bad guys. You just are a really confident person. That's what traditional martial arts is. We are, in men, especially in today's society, martial arts is a whole category. You kick, you punch, you're a martial artist. No, that's not true. If you learn character development, you're a martial artist. If, you're, if you just kick and punch, you're a bully, in my eyes. There you go. The pushback on martial arts faded for a while, right? We, we had all the movies in the 80s, and that's where people came to know, most people came to know martial arts, and a lot of those movie, movies were kind of anti-heroes, right? Like people that would pop up, and they'd, you know, defend somebody, and they often took it a little bit too far, and, you know, you root for them, but, you know, you can see that they're a flawed person. And that kind of went away, and then the UFC happened. And the terms MMA, everybody, everybody knows what MMA stands for, whether you train or not. Everybody knows that stands for mixed martial arts. So what's the part that people hear? They hear martial arts. Mm -hmm. They hear it's a mixture of martial arts. And then they hear Taekwondo is a martial art. And they draw an equivalency. That it, oh, it's the same, or it's similar. 
and just by hours across a year, the average person who doesn't train, what do they get more of? Information about what's going on in professional mixed martial arts or what's going on in the dojo down the street? How much more time, how much time has Conor McGregor gotten on TV versus, I don't know, me? every single traditional martial artist on the planet combined, right? Like it doesn't even come close. So if you look at someone like him or uh, the, the John Jones steroid controversy, you know, any, any of these things, I follow MMA a, a bit because I find it interesting. It's exciting to watch, but it's not what I teach and it's not what I do. Is there some overlap in the punching and kicking and the physical skills? Absolutely. Are there people who train MMA that are absolutely wonderful people? Yeah, I know some of them. But I think that's where a lot of it comes from. And I've, I wish I could go back in time and I wish I could go to the beginning of the UFC and say, let's call it MMC, Mixed Martial Combat. Can we do that? Can we make that very small change? Because I think that would be just enough for people to go, okay, they're similar, but they're not quite the same. And I see myself as a self-appointed a guardian of traditional martial arts. I mean, no, nobody gave me that role. I, I took it. And not to say that I don't want help. You know, it's not mine to do solo. But anything that makes people less likely to train or, or send their children to train, I see as, as a negative. And for all the good about the UFC, these are some things that I would like to see changed, and, and not just them, Bellator, all of them, because it creates confusion. And this is where, as Whistle Kick grows, one of the things I want to do is essentially, you know, this is sort of a, a, an awareness-based nonprofit so that people start to see that there are differences. You all know that there, what the differences are. I don't have to explain that to you, but if we grab 10 random people off the street, you're going to... Oh. You're going to go get the 10 random people? Okay. All right. Well, don't, don't use martial arts to get them in, right? Like, don't hurt them. I tell them we have gear. Yes. No. So that's where I think it is. Let's, let's do one more, because I have to drive through a snowstorm. Apparently, everyone's looking at you, Katan. Why is everyone looking I don't know, but now we are, too. Noah, if you have a question, you can ask. I'm getting a big Katan. <laughs> well, it's good she has you to give her ideas. Uh -huh. uh, that sounds, I don't it's know. Terrifying. That's Noah's crazy. ideas are scary. Mm -hmm. I don't think it went over well. We're not saying that. One. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kedai. <laughs> I'm gonna filter you there. Um, hmm. If everyone looks at her more, she'll come up with a question. <laughs> if someone else has oh, something. May, do you have a question? Do you have a question? Any question? Any question at all? All right, I got another one. How, for teaching, when you have a new student that comes in that's acting like they know everything, how would you, and they've had like no experience in martial arts, how do you not combat that, but understand that and deal with it in your school? It's mm, a great question. They're just trying to relate to you. So I just say, show me your moves. That's really cool. You want to see how I do it? And I just engage with them because all they're trying to do, it's one of two things. Anyone who runs a martial arts school or teaches martial arts classes know that the first question they're going to get from the parents is, how much does it cost? And then the first kid, the question the kid's going to ask is, can I hit this? Right? Those are the first two questions always. And the reason why is because people really don't know what to ask. They don't know how to relate to you. All they know about you is what they think they know about you. And what they think they know about you, we just talked about. It's stuff they see on movies, TV shows, UFC, right? Like all of that stuff is what they think they know about you. So when that happens, say, oh, wow, that's really cool. Let me show you how I do it. And then connect with them on almost a kid level is usually the easiest way to handle that. The most common way in, I found in working through Matic and stuff with instructors that instructors treat that is this kid's trying to tell me how to do my job. I know better than the kid. I'm the teacher. Remember that that idea and that concept comes out of a place of ego. It doesn't come out of a place of empathy and wanting to teach somebody. Teaching is just sharing. 
So let the kid share with you. If the kid may do something here, you go, oh, wow. If you're threatened by a first day student, if that threatens your ego, you shouldn't be teaching. Yeah, <laughs> potentially. Or, you, or you're a newer teacher. Or maybe, okay, all right, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm being unfair. That's why, yeah. you keep, that's why you keep me here, buddy. That's true. <laughs> what, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> hmm. Noah, how old are you? 16, that took me a second. Yeah, good. You're 16. It gets worse. Well, the thing is, Noah, he's right, but it's more apt to act, it's more apt to happen to you than it's going to happen to me. 16 year old comes in, looks at me and goes, oh, okay, he's, he's an old guy. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. 16 year old looks at you and says, oh, he's, he's my peer. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can outshine him. Like Craig said, just say, okay, just, just see, what he's, see what he's got and sit here. This is the way I do it. This is the way we do it here. It can come from ego, but can, it can also come from a place of fear. Because one of the things for, for all that all the good that we do getting people to come in they have to acknowledge to come in most of them i don't know what's going to happen i don't know how to act i'm terrified but i'm going to do it anyway right like that's just about everybody's experience when they walk in the door and people handle fear in different ways some people handle fear by trying to act like they know what they're doing how many times i'm sure if you've taught more than five people, you've had at least one of them say, I know. You show them a correction. I know. Yeah, I know. Right. And that's it can seem like that's coming from a place of ego, but it's usually coming from a place of defensiveness. It's they're, they're being protective of their own self-esteem because just existing in this space can be terrifying. So I find when I get somebody like that who's who is like that, I take it as a challenge. I need to make them feel more comfortable. And the better a job I can do making them feel comfortable with being a white belt, with being wrong, with not knowing anything, can be really helpful. Um, I've seen some instructors that will literally take their black belt off and put it on a kid. You know, because this usually happens with kids, but it does also happen with adults. I've seen adults, especially if they come in, if they've got boxing background or a wrestling background. So, you know, they're not, they don't realize they're uncomfortable. They recognize they want additional skills in this other thing, but they're used to being in a similar environment where they do know what's going on and they're not quite sure how to be vulnerable at that time. So I think compassion is really the heart of it. And the more compassionate you can be, it's rare that throwing compassion as, at a situation makes it worse. In fact, I would say oh, never. I, I like that thing of taking off the belt and putting it on yeah. somebody because it, it gets you into that situation of who's really teaching who here. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, you're learning from them as much. Yeah. yeah, it depends on the age. It depends on the circumstance. And the way I handle it in a group is different than the way I handle it one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'm sure you guys would say the same thing. Um, and, and I find that that is less common now as um, trials happen or one-on-one, -on -one, you know, intros are, are happening. Because all that stuff gets, you know, by the time they step foot into a, a group class, they've usually had, you know, half hour, an hour one-on-one -on -one or maybe two-on-one -on -one and they know a little bit about what to expect yeah i remember when i first started meeting with like uh, you know newer students and that sort of thing i would always make sure to put on my most like faded uniform that had clearly been mm -hmm. around for a decade and i'd put on like the ripped and tattered belt because i wanted the parent to see that i've been doing this for a long mm -hmm. time but what i just what i came to realize as I matured in my own training is as much as that was to show the parent that also was for me to, mm -hmm. to, to come from a place of expertise and it didn't serve the, the child, right? It didn't serve the kid. So now um, what I'm dressed in currently, my gi pants and a dragon hoodie or some sort of sweatshirt is usually what I do those in because I still, like I said earlier, I believe that titles and rank are is the biggest detriment to what we do because it it breaks bridges, right? Mm -hmm. It makes it harder for people to find us accessible. You know, back in the day, you know, we didn't know what car our instructor drove. Mm -hmm. We didn't ever see them wearing normal clothes. They came down, they taught class, they they 
went back to the office. They teleported they, they out. They walked away. They weren't there right at the beginning and they weren't there right at the end. They were gone. They came in, they instructed, they left. And that makes, that, that adds, at the time, it was to add mystique, right? It was to, I am the sensei, I am, because that's what it was. And then, you know, fortunately for me, the instructors that I had had early on who did things like that kind of phased out. My primary instructor wasn't like that at all. We knew what car he drove. We, he used to bring his dogs to the dojo. Like, we knew everything about him. There were just pugs running around in the karate school all day. It was, uh, it, and one black belt. Uh, anyway, um, I found that students learn better, are more engaged, they stay longer, they're happier, and ultimately become more skilled and talented in what I'm asking of them when they realize that the person sitting in front of the room is just a normal human being. Mm -hmm. That also gives me permission to make a mistake when I'm teaching something mm -hmm. and then be able to go, oh, hey, I tell you the remix. <laughs> Let's go back and do this the way. So when my teachers come up, you do it the way that they think you're going to do it. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. And then I hear that the form is very interesting. Anything you yes. want to add? That's really good. Okay. Works for me. That's where we're going to call it then. So I'm going to we'll stop recordings. But if you guys want to keep asking questions, well, Wait, do we want to see? You, you flipped two of them. I know. I okay. Did. Yeah. What are they? It's train hard, smile, and have a great time. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm actually, I love that they're there because that is the biggest thing that gives me anxiety about these episodes. Really? Yes. You've only listened to almost 800 episodes. You, you know what? Listening to it and then having to repeat it, mm. two different things. Okay. Are we going to do it all together? All right. We're going to do, do it together. And we look up there because we're all going to do it together. Ready? All right. One, two, three. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.